uh, tonight's program for Healthcare for All <clears throat> is uh, the uh, a health equity program. Uh, we are, I'm Ronnie Shore, I'm the president of Healthcare for All, and we have uh, been paying more and more attention to health equity uh, as we uh, move along the pathway to achieve universal health care for everybody here in Washington State. We just recognize that uh, it's, it's the importance of ensuring health equity for a variety of groups. We've shared several different perspectives on this. Uh, so tonight, Farhia Mohammed from the Somali community will address some specific solutions for equity uh, that their organization, a community-based organization, has built. First, I'd like to share a land acknowledgement. Uh, we, uh, uh, I'm participating in this Zoom meeting today from the lands of the Coast Salish peoples. Uh, if you uh, could take a minute to acknowledge the land where you're joining from tonight, uh, we are engaging in efforts to achieve universal health care, and uh, we recognize that inequities occur uh, among many of the people and, and many communities in, uh, or groups of people in our community, and we want to first recognize or acknowledge the effect of those inequities on indigenous people uh, the, who are while we'll be talking about immigrants from another land tonight, uh, indigenous peoples are immigrants from the land that has been taken from them. Uh, we would acknowledge all of the ancestral homelands and traditional territories uh, of uh, the indigenous peoples who have been here since time immemorial. And our efforts to achieve equity in health care include uh, universal health care coverage for the Coast Salish peoples of this land. Uh, this land that touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Puyallup, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. So if you're just joining us, uh, hope you don't enter your full name on your Zoom screen. There is a opportunity to ask questions and please add those questions to our chat. We have opened up uh, or enabled live transcript. So if you notice that we're being too quiet or you're not hearing exactly what they're say you're, we're saying, you can hover over the bottom of your screen. There will be a panel of icons. One of them says CC for closed captioning or live transcript. You can click on that arrow and show subtitles to follow along. Also, you'll notice that we'll put the website for making donations in the chat. Uh, we may put other messages in there too. So please check that out. We are accepting donations tonight. Our goal is to reach $250. Uh, if you are able to give, please watch. You can go into the chat and click on that website and make a donation directly. So we appreciate that. If you're in a position to do that, we would really enjoy that. Um, what else? Uh, we the presentation, as I mentioned earlier, will be uh, featuring Farhia Mohammed from the Somali Family Safety Task Force. But before we start that conversation, before she starts, I'd like to introduce uh, a member of the Washington State Universal Healthcare Commission. Uh, so, Mohammed uh, Shadani. Yes, I'm, I'm not. 
find you here. I, I am already unmuted and I showed uh, shared the video as well. All right. So Mohammed is uh, a member of the Universal Healthcare Commission. Uh, he uh, has been had worked with the Universal Healthcare Work Group, uh, and I got to share a, you know some information with that group of stakeholders and get to know him. I have not met his baby, although I've seen the baby uh, on a couple of Zoom meetings, uh, and we can hear the baby now, so that's great. Uh, the work group uh, that we participated in together was in 2019 and ended up in 2020. Uh, so I've asked him here because the Universal Healthcare Commission is one of the biggest victories for healthcare uh, reform in our state. And we're hoping that you could, you know, share, take a few minutes and introduce yourself, Mohammed, uh, talk about your role as a commissioner and vision for universal health care in Washington state. And also, you know, talk about your role uh, in your community based organization in the Somali Health Board. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Ronnie. That you really very kind with uh, the compliments. I I'm also feel very privileged to have uh, worked with you in the work group. Uh, I'm also honored to be uh, serving in the Universal Healthcare uh, Commission for the state of Washington. My name is Mohammed Shidani. Uh, I go by either name. People from the Somali communities usually call me Shidani. It's a little bit catchier. It means like fire. So, you know, everybody, everybody likes that part. But it's actually Shidani is my father, my grandfather's name. My actual name is Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed is easier. People can say that, you know, easily. I'm the deputy director of Somali Health Board right now. Uh, Somali Health Board is very you know, modest, like small uh, grassroots organization that helps to uh, see if we can reduce uh, the healthcare disparities within uh, the county and the state, make sure that everybody has access to uh, not only affordable healthcare, but it's also provided with the uh, most correct information and the, um, with dignity and uh, you know, humanizing their, their, you know, our all of our differences, but using it to to educate ourselves and you know care for each other the best way we can my uh my involvement with the the you know original work group and then now the universal health uh, care uh, healthcare commission is i hope i i got to learn through this journey i got to learn a lot of a lot of things about uh what makes wow. what made our health you know healthcare in this country well, you know, a lot more expensive than uh, other countries uh, who have, uh, who, who, who might have like comparatively uh, same kind of population or smaller or bigger. I, th I think, and that's the question that we need to sort out, like, why is it so expensive? What can we do uh, before we start, before we can even think about doing something for this country? We, we need to do a lot of work uh, for, in, in our state. Uh, by not only making it, making sure that it's accessible to everyone, but also affordable, and uh, it, it basically dignifies people. I'm sure some a lot of a lot of you might have visited the urgent care, the you know, primary doctor's office, or the emergency um, emergency uh, hospital. None of your pain, none of your hum, human characters is is you know upheld or characterized there. You so you just add a number. You come you come through. A doctor sees you. They chart. They build the insurance. You are out of there most most probably. What we should be doing before we even get there is to make sure that everybody has access to preventive care. If everybody's health is protected before it got sick, I think that would reduce the cost uh, a lot. But there's this a lot a lot more complexities within the system that I hope we can uh, we can do uh, as the commissioners the commissioners and our colleagues and allies uh, within the, you know, the, the healthcare system, uh, that we can figure out why is it so expensive, how can we do it better, but once we do it to, you know, to create a system that does not leave anyone behind, that's not, that, that's not also look like small people, like young, you know, refugees and new immigrants and undocumented, everybody in the state of, in the state of Washington 
has a duty on us. We, we have to care for them and make sure that everybody is taken care of. Uh, when we do that, I, I don't know who said it, but we're only as strong as our, our weakest link. When we take care of like, the people, like uh, the people that are exposed, people who cannot care for themselves, I think that is where our strength comes from. I tend to speak a lot, uh, especially during the, you know, the evenings when I'm really tired. So I'm gonna cut it there. I can take uh, one or two questions. And, but I appreciate you having me, Rani. So I really wanted just to focus on uh, getting that introduction. Uh, thanks so much for sharing those important points and, and focusing on uh, the cost. That, you know, that's certainly a major issue that we're working on. Uh, and But looking at <clears throat> preventive health and some of the real causes of our health problems. So thanks for your work. Thanks for sharing that information with us. And I think we're in, in lieu of uh, uh, questions for you, we'll uh, ask uh, people to focus on questions for our primary speaker, for Farhia tonight. Uh, so uh, I'm going to let you go. I know you've had a long day. We hear that wonderful baby in the background. So thank you very much. But have a lovely evening, and we'll see you online at the commission meetings. Thank, thank you, you very thank much, you. Mohammed. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Bye, Mohammed. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. So uh, I'd like to bring on one of our most effective volunteers, uh, Consuelo, I, I struggle because I don't know whether to use your nickname or your full name, uh, but uh, would like to welcome you, Cello, uh, to join us uh, and and then bring in our key speaker, uh, uh, Farhia Mohammed, uh, and uh, I'll take myself out of the screen and let you introduce Farhia. Thank you. Well, this is a great pleasure and an honor to introduce my sister, Farhia. And I say that in for real, she's my sister. We've, we've been through a lot together. We've grown a lot together. She helped me get my MPH. Without her, I wouldn't have been able to do my work. Um, Farhia is an amazing leader in her community. She um, is very humble, so she's not going to say this, but I will say this for her. She is one of the first Somali women to talk about domestic violence and to address the deep taboo of domestic violence in her community, as well as one of the only Somali women that's actively talking about homelessness and, and issues in mental health. Uh, she is the founder and director of the Somali Family Safety Task Force, and I'm turning it over to her, Sfadhiya Mohammed. Thank you so much, Chalo. I know yeah, we struggle together, we cry together, we did all everything together. Thank you so much. I know I'm the founder, but also you did a lot with the Somali Family Safety Task Force. So and um, again, uh, thank you for inviting me and then this opportunity to talk with you all. Oh, what happened? My uh, one second. Okay, yeah. there we go. Okay, so my yes, my name is Farhia Mohammed. I'm executive director and the founder the Somali Family Safety Task Force. So all yes, this is like you can read our website. But the Somali uh, Family Safety Task Force, when I I was a founding, I see a lot of things in need. I used to work to Refugee Women's Alliance as a domestic violence advocate. I was the fairest and Somali woman who started working with Refugee Women's Alliance as a DV advocate. I get a lot of attack, a lot of people, they don't like to talk about domestic violence. They said, we don't have it. So. Then the, we were new cameras, 1999, 2000. So 2003, Takwila city is small. And then a lot of Somalis, they resulted there. So the one is the residents at the night calling to the police. It's happened to the Somali community. It's all Somali. So then the 
city of Tukwila, they contacted to Refugee Women's Alliance, Riwa. So they told, okay, we have it, a lot of Somali, domestic violence is going on, we don't know what to do. And that the Riwa project, uh, that uh, Tukwila project, they told me, you can work with your community. I told them, you know, I'm working only women. I'm supporting to the DV victims. But this project is not only for like uh, the women. We need to educate for the leaders, imams, everybody to know what is domestic violence, what is consequence when is like the person went to the refugee and immigrant a refugee, especially go to the jail, what's going to happening? Because of the, like when you are a green card holders or when just like you have it, your I-94, if you go to twice to the jail, the third time, you will be deported. So also the community, they don't believe it is a taboo. We never had to domestic violence talking about to the Somali community in back home. If your husband beat you or if your husband like uh, didn't give you anything or you're all there is like your family who is the son that one is the family matter it's not outside if like you know starting to talking we don't have it, the police or like the the legally to say oh no this one is not going to happen or husband will in the jail okay the finally families maybe they saying okay let us and um, you can divorce this one but otherwise nobody like um uh, take them to the court or to the child support. So the woman, she came that culture, everything in your home, keep it. So when you come in here, it is really hard to talk about uh, what is like uh, happening. And then like CBS also, we had the CBS, like, you know, if you both of you guys fight the kids, they remove. So the woman said, I don't want yes to my kids. Sometimes also the woman is they isolated and then the shining. So the husband, he maybe like when he came, he learned English immediately before for the wife or he is outgoing. He knows when is the police call in heaven. There is no interpreter sometimes. They use for the kids. The kids, they scared their father, whatever he tell them, they have to tell. So many of the victims get arrested. So the, when we see, so we say the Taquil project, how we started to task force, I'm telling you guys. So we talk, we said, we have to educate. We have to talk to imams. None of the community members agree to help me to talk for the whole community. I couldn't find anybody here. The imams, they said, oh, no, 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 no. This one, we don't want to talk. And some people, they believe it. We are teaching to refugee women, I'm teaching to women to call to 911, how to call to 911, which we are not doing, but we need to families together, but it's the victim. If he's being so badly, that some of them, they become into mentally ill isolation because you don't have it, any of your family. Your family is still is the back home. And then this one, he's your husband, he's your brother, he's your sibling, because we went to all over to the country. Some of them like, all oh, my own families, we come different times. We went to different countries. Some of them, they went to Italy. Some of them, Saudi Arabia. The, when we cross to the border, it's not only one immigration. Like some of us, three, uh, three places, four places went to there. So in here, that woman to her husband, he is everything for her. So the, she is like, yeah, trusted him, everything. But this guy, he is against to her. What should she do? Some of them, the while they keep in like, they become into mentally ill. So it's really hard. And then when she go to the hospital, even she cannot tell. Or like she doesn't know, we don't have it, even counseling in back home. We never did to the counseling. So this Tequila project, we did like I found someone who came in, the, like he was imam that time. He lived then for Colorado. We brought him, he's big Somali, Arabic, English. We brought him here. Then... He did educate the community. When he talked to them, to the community they like, we continue. So the, when we finished the project, it was 19 months, uh, 18 months. When we finish, like everybody liked it. And then to like uh, six men and the eight women, they said, we really need to continue this education. And that's how I found it to the Somali Family Safe Task Force. 
So we formed a task force and then the, like my agency where I was working, they promised to have it for the like a monthly meeting for the community. And then to uh, provide refreshment, then the, all the uh, uh, committee, they said, okay, if we okay, the, get to like the victims, we need to solve our own way. If that one didn't work, and then we will support, so we will send for here to help for the victims. We agreed that, short story, I get married, I move out of the state. <laughs> <laughs> and the task force collapsed. Club, because the person they hire, she couldn't handle, and then she doesn't have any good relationship with the community. So I went to there, and then I could not stay there. So I moved back to the Washington State. So the, when I came back, uh, the, everybody's coming. Uh, why you don't start our task force? We need to education and then the we apply for like engaging main projects. So I started working as consultant, but I was working to the Southwest Youth and Family. I said, I need to change because everybody, they changed my name, which for here? And instead to say for here, Mohammed, they say for here, the one who divorced to the wives. So my parents, they hate that name. And then like they told me when I moved back, don't walk to Rio anymore find other places. I start working for Southwest Youth and Families. But the river, I was growing up with them. I was young when I started. So still they keep calling me. Then they said, oh, why you don't work as a consultant? To help us to outreach something and still to work to the DV. I trained someone to work with the DV. And then I, yes, I was working that. So the community, they pushing me. Then when I went to grad school, my project I took, I said, oh, okay, I will do research for the domestic violence in the Somali community. When I tried to do that, I couldn't find it, any study being in the Somali community. So I went to go back to my professor. I told him, you know, I couldn't find it. I need to do to like a Muslim woman slash Somali. And then she agreed. So the community, when I come, they said, okay, you're doing this one, but how you can come back? All the researchers, they are not coming back. I told them I'm not researchers. I am in the community. So the, the, when I finished my school, I promised to do something. So then they like, I did to like all of them to the focus group. They asked it to do to sewing class because when they, the victims get out, they don't have skills and the computer class, cooking class, couple of things. The first project, Jello and I, we started the sewing class. So that one is not only learning to sew in class. The woman is, when they came, that is their mental health support. When they came because they are isolated at the home. So they are coming, socializing, like that three hours they there with us, they socialize. So one woman, she told us, you know, when I came here, it's not like only to like a sewing, but I do to socialize. I counted Saturdays, you know, whatever they make, they take in that nice fabrics. We give them the dresses, even also it's like long dresses was really hard sometimes to find. They can make their own way what they need. So that's how we started. And also I did to my mental health project weaving program. I was doing my practicum at Lutheran communities. The one they give me to like a couple of clients is the, my practical instructor, she told me, well, here, I don't want to, te yeah, to teach you, but I can give you to the clients, you know, already, just you get into your master. So you can, uh, yes, take this client. Whenever I call them, if I ask it, why are you here? Oh, I don't know, my doctor sent me. I want to get to the bus to the test because I couldn't pass the test. So. I told her this is not going to work. So they don't know about the mental health. Your doctor sent you to the counseling. Oh, I'm not crazy because my country, either two things, you will be fine or you will be mental health institute, not between that. So I told them, no, you know, then here is the counseling is available because you guys, many uh, countries, you guys immigrate and also you come here, maybe you lose your husband, your kids, your family members. So all that, you have a nightmare. So when I told to, like I said, they can do to the weaving group, how you can get to the materials. I tried to find it California. I couldn't uh, find it the way, uh, what they need. 
the bomb trees we get it to do for the like the, that woman she's weaving it's really hard to get that so then uh, like i send it to many somali my brother he send it we get it so when we start women's day talking them oh you know all day i was home when the kids go so if telephone come i cannot answer i start crying sometimes i cannot eat all that they have in mental health oh my friend of the me my uh, kids my daughters they get raped i get raped i get to the front of me my husband killed one woman said my husband got killed i get raped but all that nobody like talk about them and then to our culture we cannot talk to the mental health in here when they go to the hospital sometimes they cannot tell because all the time interpreters they change it so i don't have it any interpreter to trust so the also you have to build trust when they telling you so then we started i said okay this is like mental health instead to give them to like a when the mental health at the night time if you cannot sleep to the ball or say the bop bop this one we give them to prayer beats i buy a couple of prayer beats i said okay at the night time use this prayer beat so you can sleep the women is they agree so the how is the solution we did for that mental health so the when they came every fridays so they get socialized they eat the food ethnic food we now sitting here doing to this picture it is like mental health support group so they do to the baskets they also talk about their mental health issue they trust each one is they make friends they can call in each other is instead like you know to days by yourself home they make us friends they call it they giving each other to write so also some if they don't drive we send to hoping to camp that day but it's really hard you know sometimes mental health and i guess you some you cannot access private insurance also even if you find it because of the there is no health insurance the medical kuban they are taking so that medical sometimes is not covering for them but yes and blast domestic violence many of uh, families is really hard when you go because coming to this is the domestic violence will so of the muslim wills some of the unhealthy relationship health relationship power and control so i cannot talk more this one the next time but like domestic violence every country every religion exist it's not only us but for us we never talk to sit also one time we apply grant we did leadership trainings that project was successful we were thinking about 8 to 10 people we end up and uh, training 16 people after the 16 people i stopped i said no like couple of imams right here four imams attended and then to other uh, yes, uh, the, the women is uh, like other two men that day they, they are not here but like yes we had six men and 10 women we did like a break into silence we said domestic violence training nobody can come so oh, what they can tell us they are americans we don't need to domestic violence but domestic violence is exist even sometimes when they said i tell them okay why is our divorce rate high if we don't have domestic violence in the community oh we don't know the women when they came they changed it i said no because of the women you guys never tell them what they needed or what they need to do sometimes the husband is going to the school but the woman she's not going to the school sometimes like yeah the, so the when he uh the, he's walking his money he want to use it her money or he said oh i can use that uh my family how about my family so there is the fighting coming up also sometimes they are not legalizing to the woman to marry some of the some of the women is they bring him back home when the woman came here she doesn't have it her green card she depend on him so he was threaten to her oh like if you say i talk or if you say something i'm not going to make it i can send you back home you will deport it or i will tell all your fa- families we will revenge there my family will do so the woman she is quiet while she is quiet she became for like a mentally ill isolation because he is leaving in the morning 
she's like having to the baby staying home he wouldn't let and then when he went to take her out he's going so she cannot talk anybody so that is like why the task force we started to solution for the women we help for the women and then when we train to the men and the imams the imam he told us this guy he is like a middle of the second one in the left side he said you know always when they come we never ask it to the woman what's happening we can ask it husband and the her family maybe her brother or someone she send it but we never yes yeah, like think about that way and the safety plan i ask it him did you do to safety plan with them what did you do so the imam he realized it you know we face it so many things then we never yes yeah, like a uh, said oh this is your fault or if you cannot do this one i can take your wife to the shelter or i can put here so it's really hard sometimes they depend on his medical so she cannot access for the medical the woman is like if we have it for everybody health care is like that's good because we don't have it so many of them they become to diabetics high blood pressure cholesterol it's like our communities like the women's asthma also the kids when they come in the country is healthy but they put them to like yeah, all the houses which they didn't know and then to our country is like the last thing you can speak to the house or indoor and outdoor educational so the people they come they start heat of the building has let bend mostly when they come to the refugee and immigrants of all my east africans they will put them to south in the city but to the north or bellevue east side they don't put they will stay that one also the bollocks to the refugee resettlements that's discrimination priority number one priority number two i used to walk for the refugee agencies i saw them those ones so oh i said why you take into east side this bible not for our bible when they came oh is that here but here i'm going to interrupt you for one minute explain what a bolag is because i bet people don't know oh okay bolag is the refugee resettlement like lutheran and the irc world yes relief those ones now you understand the people who bring them to the refugees the country those ones we call to like a bolax so the when they bring them they but they match there is no solution some of the single only 3 months if you have family 8 months they end up getting sick their kids asthma so they nobody tell them to like you know you can access this nice housing or the health insurance they have in medical some of them they never been in school so the when they came here they don't know they have to start that learning to ESL class but some of them like we had for the doctors or someone who's well educated even like you know most of the somalis the like the old generation they study italian so the english is like you know it's really hard to speak for them i know some of the doctors they end up driving for the uber taxis so that's like why is that low level right? you know so the when you were doctor and then in here when you came and the up taxi driver uber drivers stress blast stress and they stressing so there is no health insurance also uber and the taxi drivers unless sometimes you buy some people they don't afford it they don't want to go mostly men they don't have it uh, for the like insurance they don't go unless you walk for like other companies or you will educate you get or maybe uh, some the places the warehouse they have it insurance but some insurance is like if you take into medical coban like oh yes my your kids has asthma but in this insurance is not covering your your uh, the, the, the uh, what what you need it so the asthma a burial they need it it's really hard to cover one woman she said i know why i need the, the blue card they said no your insurance is not covered said i need to add my own money because like my son it is not this one to the burial is not working for him so it's really hard to healthy care discrimination is going on we need healthy care for everybody 
Because if we don't have healthy care, so many issues is going on to the community. Overweight, like the mental health, mental health we cannot talk is a taboo. Like it's really hard, domestic violence is a taboo. Woman, when she's victim, as I told you earlier, she traumatized it. And then the people also, when they came, like they lost their country, they lost their dignity, everything. They went to maybe two, three countries. Those people, when they come in here, they end up to sickness. Nobody has like a bit to their trauma. Or like, you know, to when they traumatize it, they have to go to counseling. Like we did, uh, like now it's the three years, is the, this is like over, we finished it last Saturday. We did Islamic healing trauma. That Islamic healing trauma helped them. Many of them, they said, you know, yes, I was not sleeping. I did this. So we really needed like the people to access health insurance no matter what. If you don't have health insurance, you don't have nothing. So it's really hard people with the, like uh, insurance and the people with the medical coupon. Obamacare, why you don't apply Obamacare? Obamacare, when I found out, many of the things is not like accessible. It is not covered. So many refugee and immigrant, it's really hard to have. So like uh, the, the, the last slide, uh, the, the other slide to the cello showing us before this one, it is like we did to like, uh, yes, this is the kids and some adults. We run that day because like we form it for the health, healthy eating, exercising, because I see a lot of kids were uh, overweight. So the, when we did this one that day, a lot of people, they didn't show up. We went to like a, to run for the five mile. Some of the day get to the metalists or the, the kids and their parents. We run like two and a half mile this way, two and a half mile this day. So yeah, they really like it to the kids and the parents. We walk to summertime because like in the street you stay in home and then you're not eating healthy food. You just like, you don't have it, any exercise. Many of uh, the women, is, they don't like to go to the gym because there is not to like, a, only women's gym this area. So if you go to women's gym, you can enroll it, you can go there, but there is no, the women's gym. Many mothers, when we talk with their girls, they said, oh yes, I don't have it. And the healthy eating food, they eat a lot of sugar, the, a lot of oil. So we did two classes to eat in healthy eating. So that one also, you know, to it's give you to your mental health to release and you are the same with the others. So instead your kids and you getting overweight or like yes, healthy issue coming. So the one thing is like, if you the kids become too overweight, asthma, have it, the diabetics. Many of our kids, they are diabetics too. So it is hard when you immigrant, I'm talking about the Somali community and East Africans, we face so many health issues. So I really need to see for like the healthy care for all in Washington state. So yeah, you can go to the other slide. Wow, you're really uh, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. calling out the the words that we want to scream for, uh, mm -hmm. calling for health care for everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. So th qu quite a powerful ending. Thank you for uh, sharing like, that. Like a couple of, oh, if I finish, I don't know. But like when is the during the pandemic also happened, many people, they don't want to go to hospitals. They said, oh, if I go, I don't have health insurance. I told them you should go. We had like, you know, educational. We did, we brought a uh, brought couple of doctors. They did educational because if we cannot do for the women the educational, they cannot go. They said, oh, I don't have insurance. If they judge me more money. I told them, you know, you care uh, your health or you worried about the money. So I brought a couple of doctors from Harborview. And then they educate them. We, so there are barriers from our system, barriers from within the community. Uh, yes. Those are hard things to talk about. 
Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, let Gigi and Consuelo put together the questions. Uh, if you have, if someone has more questions to add, please add those to the chat. So for here, I'm going to remove you from the spotlight for just a, a few moments, but don't go away. Okay. <laughs> we'll bring you back in a few moments. Uh, so uh, hang on there. Uh, and what I'd like to do is uh, uh, bring in uh, one of our board members, uh, Peter Lucas, who I'm not seeing. I'm here. You're here. But you're not on my list. I guess I don't rate, Ronnie. You don't rate, but you're so important. Ha! There you are. Uh, so Peter is going. We've been entering uh, the link for Healthcare for All website for making donations, uh, and uh, go to the chat. You can find that. Peter will talk for a few minutes about how easy it is to actually do that. And Gigi and Consuelo will be gathering questions and we'll come back in in just a few minutes. So uh, let me put you in the center, Peter. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm Peter Lucas. I'm a practicing a psychiatrist and board member of Healthcare for All Washington. And uh, we've, our organization has chalked up many successes in the past few legislative sessions. And you can go to our website to learn more about some of the, some of the successes we've had over the years. Uh, uh, we were the driving force behind the UA, the Universal Healthcare Work Group that preceded the current uh, work, UH, uh, Universal Healthcare Commission. We had seven members in, in the first group and we had many members in the second group as well. Um, that commission is, is uh, tasked with creating a system to provide health care to all Washington residents. And they could craft a single payer system based on our own bill, the Washington Health Security Trust, which has been in the, in, in the legislature for years. Uh, but in order to maintain our momentum, it is vitally important that we grow our membership, educate the public and mobilize our supporters to spread the word to their family, friends, and most importantly, their legislators. And we can achieve these goals through social media, monthly webinars like this one, meetings with civic groups, and by uh, hosting other events. And now that uh, COVID is retreating in Washington, let's, ho let's hope that it'll be quiet for a while. We plan to get out more from behind our laptops and smartphones and meet with people in person. In addition, we have a very dynamic and effective lobbyist, communications specialists, and other fixed costs. And naturally, these activities and obligations all require funds, which is why we are asking you to donate tonight, as we do at every webinar. And tonight, our goal is $250. So please go to our website or go to the chat and click on the Donate button. You can make a one-time donation, of course, but we would especially appreciate it if you could make a monthly recurring donation. As I like to say, it's like a Netflix subscription, except you might get universal healthcare instead of movies. So please donate so we can spread the word and bring about universal single payer healthcare in Washington. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, now uh, I'm going to and 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 certainly keep adding any questions that you may have in the chat and as peter said follow the chat to find the links uh let me uh bring uh farhia back in and introduce uh and i'd also like to bring in gg davison uh and gg will has been reviewing the chat following the chat and so gg uh, if you and uh, I think Consuelo can help you, can prioritize the questions. If you can share uh, two or three questions uh, for here, I hope you will be able to uh, answer those questions. So if you can unmute yourself for here, for here I'm going to step out of the spotlight. Thank you. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. It was 
really interesting. I personally did not know about any of this stuff happening. Um, and it's really cool to see like the impact that it has, like so close to home. Thank you. Yes. So, um, oh yeah, and also for everybody, I'm Gigi. Um, I'm a volunteer here um, at Healthcare for All Washington. And yeah, so, okay, I, our first question um, I'm gonna ask is from Ronnie. Um, so gender-based violence is a taboo topic among the community members, but it must be even more difficult for the women to interact with healthcare providers. How have you been able to support a woman who seeks help from our healthcare system more than just involving a good interpreter? Are there any other barriers to this? Oh, yes. For like, you know, to when they come to us, that is the last result, fairest result. Because like, you know, when you come out, it's like 80% women, they cannot go back that relationship because seeing help is the last resort. And then interpreter is, is really hard sometimes because we also fought as a tribal issue too in back home, that one I forgot. So if it's like, you know, to interpret into the court or to the medical, if it's my husband's tribe, that guy, I don't want to talk because he's going to tell. Yeah. And then also he has like, if it's a court, a couple of times to the court, even to like, uh, we make sure who is going to interpret that time to when we get into the protection order. Mm -hmm. Because of the like, you know, to the woman, like I, we told them to the office of the interpreter at court. Okay, before like two days, three days, can we know who is coming? And then we know that one. Or sometimes if we didn't get early, the client didn't say when she go there, she doesn't want to talk. And then why you don't want to talk? Oh, I don't want to hear like whatever I said, he can tell. So it's really hard, but the medical, some of them, when they trust the person, they will tell, or sometimes they don't tell. Oh, why you didn't tell your doctor when you injured these things? Oh, I don't want yes, like anybody to know. It's really hard when they go. Sometimes they don't see help, but it's really hard, yes. Like we try yeah. to educate them, yes, like our women. Yeah, so it's basically so in order to combat that, I mean, is it just communicating with them and like developing trust and an open line of communication then? Yes. Trust is key, yes. If I don't trust you, I don't want to tell what's going on. I don't know what you can do, right? Mm -hmm. So some of them, like, you know, when they came to the country, if they don't have medical also car, they don't want to go to the hospital. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually kind of relating to that question, um, Chris asked, um, is there any difficulty in finding women to interpret for these difficult conversations? Um, I'd imagine women would be less comfortable sharing this with a male interpreter. Sometimes some women, is they comfortable with the men? Because men, they said, oh, don't talk that too much. Mm -hmm. uh, but like some women, yes. But like the court, we make sure the interpreters, they get uh, trained. Because like we end up like one time. So this woman, she didn't know English. And then interpretation, the interpreter guy who was interpreting her, or woman, I cannot remember, a couple of years ago. So told her, okay you cannot yeah, contact him physically. And instead to tell no phone, no third part, everything, right? So the woman, she called. She said, oh, I need something in the home. Why you give so-and-so? And then husband, he knows, already he understood. He called the police. He said, she's uh, uh, bothering me. Mm. Calling me, she broke to confidential for this yes, protection order. So then to like the one the court, the, the police call her, why you call it? I asked her, oh, nobody told me that. The interpreter to the court, they didn't tell you. I said, no, she said, you cannot call. You cannot, yes, like send anybody else. And then you cannot contact it. If you see five feet, you have to move out. So mm. it's really hard, yes, some interpretation also. Sure. Do you have um, like specific Somali like lawyers that you go to or do you just use the like? No, I don't have it. Even now, like I'm looking so badly volunteer lawyers because when we fill uh, the filing for as a task force, we small, but we have so many clients. 
And then the only we send it to like our client is Northwest immigrant. Mm -hmm. And then they fool all the time. So I'm looking also some of the lawyers who already retire or like, you know, they don't have a lot of clients to help us. Yeah. Like, you know, finding to the lawyer is really important for us to fill in out, to give consultation, even if they don't represent it to the court, but to these legal documents to help them. That's what we really need. Because all the men, also the, now the case I'm working, he received six, seven letters from the male. Mm -hmm. Other men, they support him. Oh, he is really great. But like Alain said, how they know in my home, they never come. And then like, we don't have it, the money to hire for her to attorney. She doesn't have money. So we depend on the one lawyer who like help us to prepare for her. He has it to the lawyer. So yeah, that's like what we need more also. Yeah. That's, it's tough. Yeah, it's definitely, it's hard to find a good lawyer and you know, mm -hmm. There's some pro bono people out there, but I I don't yeah mm -hmm. hard to hard to find I'm sure. Yes. Um. Actually, kind of also relating to that. So, are there some like therapists and psychiatric practitioners in our area who can provide mental health care to Somali residents? Couple of them. Okay. We have a lot because like also when I was in the school social worker, I did health mental health. Well. Oh. Yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, so we can do to therapy, but it's really hard. Also, it's really hard to understand some people; they don't understand. And then it's not a lot, like you know, to like my age who speak English, Somali, very cultural knows. So yes, yeah, like, but the other is, yeah, it's not a lot for the mental health to consider, but we have it couple of them now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Also, too, can I just? Can I just, Farhia's sister, can I just add something? Yes, please. So one of the things that I just want to emphasize is that the basket weaving and the sewing club and the girls group and the mothers group and all of these activities that Farhia and I have in the past worked together to do and Farhia is still continuing, these are all incorporating, these are culturally specific access to strengthening mental health because the taboo is so strong, Peter, to answer your question, I don't believe in Farhia, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that a Somali woman would go see a psychiatrist. No, yeah, no, no, it's really hard. Because like, you know, we have it only two things, either become too crazy to go mental institute or you find. So that is like, yeah, between we don't have to counseling or not. But some of really, really sick here, their doctors, they prescribe for to go to psychiatric. Yes, Chelo, thank you, you mentioned. Now we have it monthly and uh, mother's talk. We call it monthly mother's talk. Every second Saturday, we meet three to five, but we say three to five, but sometimes we get until 7 p.m. <laughs> We don't want to call, yes, like, you know, to the domestic violence support group, but the person who ran, she is like a yeah, mental health therapist. So she talk, we talk more about the mental health issue. We talk, yes, that one. Every month, we just come into this Saturday now. We have it every month. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and I think, well, this question, uh, you had a question in that you, you you sent in the chat the, about the attitudes toward Phoebe. Do yes. you want to ask that right now? Sure. So, sister, has have the workshops and all of your work and talking and the work with the moms and the work with the men as well as with the women. Have you seen a change in attitudes towards domestic violence in the community? Yes, some of them to that, like the break in silence when we did two elf weeks. We also hired professional domestic violence. None of the Somalis trained them, those people. So we get to like Asian women, other American people, because I really need, they can see different people, what they believe, what they have, what they've been done. Lawyers come, everybody that two elf weeks. So yes, the imam, yes, he mentioned it also. He said, you know, I didn't know all this shift plan. I can use it this time now. And then he said, I can meet with the woman too. So the woman, uh, yes, and the husband separate in the street to ask and tear to bark her family members. 
you know, before also win-win situation, women is they sit one corner and then the men they sit one corner. First three weeks, then after that, like they, you know, find it helpful. So the imam, like someone said, oh, I didn't know that imam, he can talk to me. I didn't know that imam, he is this, yes, good. So yeah, he said, you know, we have to support to the, you know, the women is because of the some men. And then to, he told to do this, we did end of the, that 12 weeks, one week we did to like University of Washington involve it also an uh, evaluation and the, the uh, the fourteenth week we did community gathering. I think over two uh, hundred people came. We had the, the everybody, even Imam himself, he did presentation on that day. All but when they did the presentation, so he talked more about how he learned it, how he's going to sell help to the women, and then he said, "Yes, it's like you know, you guys have to wake up. It exists this one that is true." So thank you so much. Yeah, okay. thank you, uh, Gigi, for uh, helping lead those questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Cello or Consuelo, for uh, you know such a, a playing a valuable role in helping us uh, uh, bring Farhia to our group. Uh, and Farhia, thank you for sharing uh, okay. those really important issues about you know, what the community can do uh, to raise their own or to overcome their own taboos uh, against something as powerful as gender-based violence, but even regular health care, seeking out regular health care. It is so hard. Uh, and also appreciate you uh, identifying, you know, those issues about insurance, about coverage, about uh, health care being available. Uh, and uh, these equity issues can, you know, uh, include a lot of issues. Uh, so in closing, I want to thank our volunteers, uh, Gigi and Consuelo, who I just thanked. Uh, I'd like to thank Peter Lucas for uh, joining us, uh, Rich Legu in the background, Ron Lovell in the background for helping us make this go so smoothly. And thank each of you for joining us tonight. And we look forward to an April meeting. Uh, we are tentatively scheduling an update or review of this very busy uh, short legislative session that is about to end on Thursday. And uh, thank you all for joining us tonight and look forward to talking to you about more health equity issues in the future, uh, about the social determinants of health. And next month, we'll be looking at political determin determinants, things that really determine our health from that perspective. So thank you all very much and have a good evening.